Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Gaming Telecom video, we're going to be discussing a smorgasbord of AMD news. This primarily is going to come in the form of Ryzen 9, as well as a bunch of Vega information. So, Ryzen 9, we're going to start out with, and it is imperative to note that, just like some of the Vega information we're going to be discussing in just a moment, it is not confirmed by AMD, therefore it's a rumour. But we do know quite an awful lot about Ryzen 9, also known as Fredripper, which is its code name. Primarily that there is going to be an up to 16 core derivative released for the consumer. In other words, this is not going to be for server markets or anything like that. It's going to be aimed at the pro user, the, the user who maybe wants to do a lot of 3D rendering or perhaps run virtual machines or perhaps do development work or whatever. Now, accordingly, this information has been leaked online. So we have an entire rundown of the... Um, lineup of processors. Now supposedly the platform name is going to be Whitehaven and the platform's socket is going to be almost identical to Nepal's. It's going to have the same number of pins, 4094. So what is the difference? Well essentially it's going to be the maximum TDP is reduced from 200 watts to 180 and the maximum number of nodes, also known as physical processors, which are basically located on the board, is going to be shrunk down from 2 plus, in other words over 2, down to just a single processor. From what we can understand, all of the CPUs are also going to support quad-channel DDR4 memory, as well as up to 44 PCIe lanes, which is an awful lot. Now, quite frankly, it's going to take me a while to read out all of this information for the CPUs, so I'm going to quickly blaze through what I consider to be the more interesting parts. The rest will pop up on screen. 1998X, also known as Ryzen 9 1998X, is going to be supposedly the flagship. It is the one we keep hearing about, 16 cores, 32 threads, with a boost clock of 3.9 GHz uh, thanks to extended frequency range. It also, just like all the other processors in the Ryzen lineup, has a little brother. In this case, it's just 1998, exactly the same number of cores. The difference is you have a 300 megahertz deficit, so we have a 3.2 gigahertz base with a 3.6 gigahertz boost. Threadwrapper also has a 14 core, which is known as 1977X and 1977. Supposedly, this has 14 cores, 28 threads, with a boost clock of up to 4.1 GHz. We also have a 12-core model, which is known as 1976X, 1956X, and 1956. These, of course, have different clock speeds, but the top-of-the-line model is 1960, 1976X, which has 12 cores, 24 threads, and it's going to run at a boost clock of 4.1 GHz. And then, obviously, as you go further down the... Uh, down the stack, for example, the regular 1956 has just a boost clock of 3.7 gigahertz. But perhaps the more interesting part is going to be the 10 core 1955X, which has a clock speed of 4 gigahertz. There are a couple of things I'd like to bring your attention to in this particular instance. The first is that, at least on the desktop, Ryzen CPUs have quite frequently had very similar clock speeds when it comes to overclocking or their maximum uh, frequency. So it's going to be very interesting, very curious to see whether that's the case for um, this particular lineup of CPUs as well. And finally, it's going to be very curious to see what the real world performance difference is going to be. Like, is there any going to be, is there going to be any changes whatsoever in the actual architecture? So for example, let's say you only have a game which takes advantage of, let's say, four threads. I'm just using an example. And let's say that you have a similarly clocked Ryzen 7 1700X versus, let's say, the 1998X. Let's say they're both running at four gigahertz for sake of argument. Is there going to be any difference? For example, is the quad-channel memory going to take uh, be advantageous? It's going to be very, very curious on how all of this works. I don't want to go super more into this because we've discussed the Ryzen 9 quite extensively over the past few days. So I think that's just about it. Uh, and also, to be honest, the Vega lineup of information is going to take me a while. So, you know. So, we all know what Vega is. I don't need to give you the story. It is, of course, the successor to Polaris. It's going to be the ultra, super duper high performance card from AMD, at least in theory. And we have some results as well as supposedly the lineup for the consumer. Uh, this first part, however, is a bit dicey because we're not exactly sure whether it's for the consumer 
or whether it's for, let's say, I don't know, the professional market. It's going to be the equivalent of like the Radeon Pro or perhaps the Instinct. Therefore, for me to say it's the RX Vega would be somewhat misleading. The reason it's a bit dicey is because there's listed to be 16 gigabytes of HPM2 memory, whereas previously AMD have confirmed just two stacks of HPM2 for regular Vegas. Either way, even if you discount that information, the most impressive thing about this is the fact that Vega has a maximum clock speed, at least according to this benchmark, of 1600 MHz, and there's also um, confirmation that we're going to see 4096 stream processors. That, by the way, is 64 stream processors per compute unit, or I guess technically it's NCU, also known as Next Compute, um, uh, sorry, the Next Generation Compute Architecture from AMD. Oh, and for those of you wondering about your flops and all of that jazz, well, if you take that into a calculator, so that would be uh, 4096 times 2, 2 operations per clock, times, let's just say nice 1600 clear, oops, almost forgot the zero there, uh, that's about 13.1 teraflops, which is not shabby. And I think this is slightly higher by about 70-ish megahertz than the previous estimate. So that's not bad. That's pretty much telling us that the Silicon 4 Vega is doing fairly well, and it looks to be fairly robust. It's going to be interesting if this is the consumer level, and finally, it's, well, I guess the most imperative thing, what is it going to really top out at, I guess, is the... The final words. Now, there is another uh, rumour concerning Vega. And supposedly, and obviously that's a very strong word, there's going to be three versions of Vega uh, which are available on launch. But don't forget, Vega is supposedly going to debut on Computex, Computex excuse me, which is the 31st of May. But according to leaked information, the cards will be available on the 5th of June. Which is, well, I guess about when you'd expect, considering that that's really pushing it for the Q2 2017 date that AMD kept telling us. Anyway, enough of that. What GPUs will there be, as well as the pricing? A website by the name of DigiWorthy has told us that there will be three graphics cards. Vega, um, Core, Eclipse, and Nova. So, Core... As the name implies, is the low end SKU. It's going to be 399 US dollars. Now, this card's quite interesting because it's the card which is going to be competing with the GTX 1070 in terms of pricing. Now, there have been a couple of leaks, a couple of benchmarks, which have put the card roughly a Vega derivative, roughly on par with the 1070. So perhaps this is it. 399 US dollars once again. Eclipse is going to be the one that's competing with the 1080. Uh, 499 US dollars is not bad. Finally, Nova. I think you can guess what this one's going to be competing against. It is, of course, the 1080 Ti, and that's going to be 600 US dollars. Now, there's a couple of things I want to uh, really, really push. Competing against is not actually saying it's equal to. So, for example, you know, I could be competing against Usain Bolt in like a 100 meter dash, it doesn't mean I'm going to beat him. You know, you can be competing against something, but it doesn't mean you're going to be beating it, or it's even going to be in the same family. So I'm not saying that in this case, the 1080 tie or the Vega is Usain Bolt. I'm just saying that we don't know how they're going to perform against each other. All we know is the market segment they are going to be targeting. Now, Personally, I believe Vega is going to be considerably faster than Pascal. The reason I believe this, well, there's a couple of reasons. One, all of the leaked benchmarks from now. Two, the information that's popped up in terms of, you know, the, the drivers were unoptimized on the benchmarks and demos that AMD have shown. And perhaps the most telling of all, and to me the most obvious, is not the fact it's got HBM2 or any of that crap. To me, the most obvious reason is it's just simply a later graphics architecture. It's like, it's about, I don't know, Pascal's just over a year-ish old, so by the time these cards come out, so really, I think AMD should be pretty much faster. Uh, to be honest, if you were to be very, very, uh, I'm being pretty, uh, pretty blunt about this, the 1060 versus the 580 are almost identical 
in terms of performance. Yes, some games perform better on the 1060, some games perform better on the 580, but they're essentially almost identical in terms of rough performance. You know, they basically trade blows. Polaris is obviously an older architecture, whereas Vega is a more modern architecture, has various changes in the uh, in the um, very core design of the on the GPU, which inherently make it a more uh, more susceptible for higher clock speeds, b more efficient, and well, c it just has a lot more stuff in it. So, and um, yes, we've t we've discussed the Vega architecture numerous times. I've got an interview with Scott Wasson on the channel, so I don't want to go too much and blabber the point on Vega and what the differences are versus Polaris. AMD keep telling anyone who will listen it's the biggest jump they've had in GPU architecture since the introduction of the initial GCN back in like the 7000 series. So I personally believe we should see quite the jump over Polaris, but ultimately I'm not telling you to invest in Vega until we see bloody benchmarks because, well, that just makes a level of sense to me. Do not ever, ever buy anything just because it's released by a company you know, unless there's a very specific reason, like for example, let's say that you already have a FreeSync monitor, then obviously you're probably going to want to buy Vega because, well, you might not want to reinvest in multiple FreeSync monitors if you've got like a really nice FreeSync setup. Similarly, if you own a G-Sync display, a uh, very nice G-Sync display, let's say, uh, I don't know, a 1440p, a couple of them, you probably are not going to be super interested in buying Vega because obviously that would mean you'd have to, you know, invest several hundred dollars or pounds or whatever in uh, the equivalent monitors, which is one issue I have with this uh, technology. And I, I do feel that monitor companies might be kind of uh, a bit sad about that as well. But hey, there are technologies on the horizon, as we've discussed in multiple times, like the new HDMI and all that, which hopefully will start to remedy that. Anyway, that's well outside the remit for this particular video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts and opinions. Especially, I'm very curious to know, what do you think about Ryzen 9? That's probably the more interesting one. Uh, assuming that it's even slightly accurate, or would you be tempted, especially if you're more than a gamer? Let's say you're, uh, I don't know, an animator. Let's say you do a lot of uh, coding or animation or perhaps virtual machine work. Would you be interested in purchasing a Ryzen 9? Anyway, take care of yourselves. Normal stuff, like, share, subscribe. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.